Hello, my name is Dr Luke Howard and I'm a consultant respiratory physician at the Hammersmith Hospital, part of the National Pulmonary Hypertension Service, and I'd like to take you through an echocardiography protocol for patients with chronic pulmonary hypertension that we developed with our echocardiography department. The most important aspect of the diagnosis of pulmonary hypertension is obtaining the correct classification, since classification defines treatment. At the most recent World Symposium of Pulmonary Hypertension held in Nice in 2013, pulmonary hypertension was reclassified according to the following five categories. The first category is pulmonary arterial hypertension. This can be further subclassified into idiopathic pulmonary arterial hypertension, heritable, and also due to drugs or toxins. It can also be associated with a number of different conditions, for example, connective tissue disease, HIV, portal hypertension, congenital heart disease, and schistosomiasis. Further classifications of pulmonary hypertension include venoocclusive disease, and then importantly, pulmonary hypertension due to left heart disease and pulmonary hypertension due to lung disease, and these, of course, are very common causes of pulmonary hypertension. It can also be due to chronic thromboembolic disease, and finally, there are a number of mixed conditions which can cause pulmonary hypertension. Categories 1, 3, 4 and 5 in this classification are all termed precapillary pulmonary hypertension. Pulmonary hypertension, as well as being classified by disease subtype, can also be classified according to the hemodynamic status in pulmonary hypertension. Let's first consider precapillary pulmonary hypertension. As previously mentioned, precapillary pulmonary hypertension consists of categories 1, 3, 4 and 5 of the pH classification. The hemodynamic definition of precapillary pulmonary hypertension is that the patient has to have a mean pulmonary artery pressure at rest of greater than or equal to 25 millimetres of mercury, a pulmonary wedge pressure or left atrial pressure or left ventricular end diastolic pressure of less than or equal to 15 millimetres of mercury, and a pulmonary vascular resistance of greater than 3 wood units. The pathophysiology behind precapillary pulmonary hypertension consists of an increase in pulmonary vascular resistance due to remodelling, narrowing, destruction and or occlusion of the pulmonary arteries. Now let's consider postcapillary pulmonary hypertension. This happens in category 2 pulmonary hypertension, which is due to left heart disease, and this can be broken down into systolic dysfunction of the left ventricle, diastolic dysfunction of the left ventricle, and valvular disease. The hemodynamic definition of postcapillary pulmonary hypertension is again a mean pulmonary artery pressure at rest of greater than or equal to 25 millimetres of mercury, but this time pulmonary wedge pressure, left atrial pressure, or left ventricular end diastolic pressure must be greater than 15 millimetres of mercury. Postcapillary pulmonary hypertension can be further subdivided into isolated postcapillary pulmonary hypertension and combined postcapillary and precapillary pulmonary hypertension. In the first case, an elevated left atrial pressure leads to a passive elevation of pulmonary arterial pressure. This is isolated postcapillary pulmonary hypertension. In this case, there is a low transpulmonary pressure difference, either measured by a difference between the mean pulmonary artery pressure and the wedge pressure being less than 12 millimetres of mercury, or the diastolic pulmonary artery pressure minus the wedge pressure being less than 7 millimetres of mercury. In the second case, we also see an elevation of left atrial pressure leading to a passive elevation of pulmonary artery pressure, but there is also a reactive component, with reactive pulmonary vascular remodelling which leads to an increase in pulmonary vascular resistance. This is combined postcapillary and precapillary pulmonary hypertension. And here we have a high transpulmonary pressure difference where the mean pulmonary artery pressure minus the wedge pressure is more than 12 millimetres of mercury, or the diastolic pulmonary artery pressure minus the wedge pressure is greater than 7 millimetres of mercury. To make an accurate diagnosis of pulmonary hypertension, we need to consider a multimodality approach. First is the clinical assessment where we undertake history and examination and assess the patient's functional class from their symptoms. Second is the physiological assessment which includes exercise testing such as six minute walk test or cardiopulmonary exercise testing. It also includes pulmonary function to look for respiratory disease 
and right heart catheterization for an accurate hemodynamic assessment. A functional imaging assessment includes echocardiography and cardiac magnetic resonance. And finally, static imaging includes angiography, VQ scanning, CT scanning and x-rays and ultrasound. Echocardiography is used mainly in the diagnosis of pulmonary hypertension, particularly when one is suspecting pulmonary hypertension and identifying further causes of pulmonary hypertension. It can be used to assess the severity of pulmonary hypertension, the degree of right ventricular impairment, and also the response to therapy. I'm now going to take you through a brief outline of the pulmonary hypertension echocardiography protocol. We start with a suspected case of pulmonary hypertension. Here is a list of some of the echo measurements that can be made that might lead you to suspect pulmonary hypertension. Once pulmonary hypertension is suspected on the basis of one or more features present from the previous list, then a more detailed right heart protocol is undertaken. Here is a list of some of the measurements that you would consider making as part of a right heart protocol. Finally, once pulmonary hypertension has been suspected and a right heart protocol undertaken, then it is important to look for underlying possible causes that can be identified by the echocardiogram. Here is a list of some of the things that you should be looking for with your echocardiogram. So we've covered a brief introduction to pulmonary hypertension and the diagnosis and the role of echocardiography in this. When you go into the protocol in more detail, you will see how the various echocardiographic views can be used to assess pulmonary hypertension, how the measurements can be derived from the echocardiographic assessment, but importantly, we've only used the variables that are used regularly in clinical practice, and we finish up with an approach to reporting. This protocol has been supported by the British Society of Echocardiography and approved by the National Pulmonary Hypertension Centres of the UK and Ireland. Thank you for listening.